I'd like to kind of show you guys how your psychology works. We talked about sleep, we talked about food, we talked about all that. What is affecting your psychology? I'm about to show you the levels of it. Jack, do me a favor and pull up the slide on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this man named Maslow. Pretty complicated, <laughs> you know, because he named it after himself. He, just, he, he created something that shows us what's going on. So at the bottom, you got the homeless guy. Homeless guy, he doesn't have any money, he doesn't have anything going for him. That's where his psychology is at, he's at the bottom there. At the top, you got someone like Elon Musk. Now, do they have the same problems? No, no they have different problems, right? At the bottom, this homeless guy's thinking about where he's gonna sleep, what he's gonna eat, and Elon Musk is like, how do we take human beings or mankind and make us interstellar or interplanetary? How do we take us from here and go to Mars or some shit? That's his, that's his thought process. Whereas this homeless guy's like, <laughs> hitting the air, you know? Like, what the fuck? The air pissed me off today. <laughs> so, believe it or not, when you're on low sleep, you end up at the bottom. You actually put yourself in the bottom. Now, every level up in this hierarchy, every time you move up, you find and can see the problems of the level below. So, when I have no money or food, Jack, bring it back. When I have no money or food, right, and I'm kinda in this place right here, my psychology cannot see the solution. I cannot find a solution. When I, I'm just thinking, what am I gonna eat? When, when am I gonna sleep? If you inhibit your sleep and you screw yourself over, or you're financially suddenly, you know, out of nowhere, financials get horrible, you might go to the bottom of this hierarchy. Instantly you'll feel stressed, you'll have way more problems than you thought, your emotions will be that of anxiety, and are we thinking about we or are we thinking about me? You go into selfishness, right? You think about yourself. Then you move up to, let's say, safety needs. Now you have a secure job, you got the nine to five, maybe you got the one bedroom apartment, or you know, you're living with a few people. All right, but you don't have that many friends. You're kinda doing your own thing, you're missing that connection. So you move up into the next part of this hierarchy. And by the way, can you oscillate between this? Someone in high school is not thinking about food and water and a job. They're just thinking about what their friends think about them. So the problems you'll find in the middle are what did they think about me? Or they'll be like, oh yeah, you, I, I'm really upset that they talked about me behind my back. Like That'll be their focus. And they're really going to try and fit in. Then you got esteem. This is someone who decides to venture off, start to become a CEO, an entrepreneur. They kind of level up, they got some people they're responsible for, maybe you're a parent now, you know, you don't really care as much what people think of you, you just, you're focused on other things, better things. And then self-actualization, this is your peak, this is you really being aware of your emotions, you're in complete control of your life, you understand that life isn't just about you, you have some greater meaning, some greater purpose, but you're that guy at the top, someone pulls a gun out, puts it to your head, where are you? You didn't sleep well for three days, where are you? The bottom. You didn't eat and you're hungry, you start getting pissed off, where are you? Bottom. This is extremely crucial to understand because if you're trying to deal with your problems and your perception is that you're at the bottom because of finance or whatever, you are immediately going to inhibit your ability to find the solution. The reason you're problem focused is because you are looking at the part of the hierarchy that you are in. Find the part you're in. Odds are you're probably in the bottom too if you have a lot of problems and anxiety. You're somewhere in the bottom. You're thinking about the worst case scenario. You're thinking about your bills. You're thinking about your payments not being made. You are struggling because you were at the bottom. Now, if you're in the middle, and by the way, this sounds crazy, but gender does have a lot to do with this. Women usually don't end up at the bottom too. They kind of, I mean, kind of maybe, maybe safety a little bit, but the middle is really where they're at. If you, if you want to talk about like the average, that's where they'll be at. It's in the middle for a reason. That is the average. Most females will be there as opposed to the bottom. Now you might say, you know, Marcel, that's sexist. No, it's not. It's a fact. It actually is a fact. Because you take any, you take almost any female in the world, someone will take care of them. No one's taking care of your ugly ass if you're a guy, you know, I promise you. <laughs> no one's being like, hey, let me bring you in, I'll take care of you. You'll be like, go get a job, loser. You know, it's just, you're, you're not a baby. So it's, it's different. Now, the pressure you have here, and this is, this is biological. This is not like constructed. These are biological needs. This is primal, these are in your nature. If you don't meet these needs in order, 
you're never going to be able to go to the level you want to go to. So when you get into the right state to sustain it, you got to make sure that these things are going well. So when you're sitting here and you're like, oh, I'm not making money, you're looping on the same problem. You're not able to elevate. The second you elevate, you're like, I know I wasn't making money. When I look back and I was thinking about my financial problems, it's very clear to me where they came from. My pedestalization of money. Money is really not something to pedestalize. We all need it. But if you perceive it that way, you'll never get it. Anything you pedestalize, impossible to get. Anything that's a big deal, impossible to get. Would you say, I'm pretty confident? Well, it doesn't matter what you say, because I am. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm not even kidding now. I'm probably one of the most confident human beings in the world. If I see someone who's more confident than me, my brain goes, oh, there's another level. Okay, I'm confident now. It's just, it's, it gets to that point. <laughs> I could just be like, oh, okay, there's more. Wait, but wait, there's more, you know? So, to be confident, it can't be external. Confidence is delusional, but so is insecurity. They're both delusional, and confidence is universal. We all have confidence. I just choose to be confident in things that I think make me feel good, whereas others might choose to be confident in things that make them feel bad. I'm confident I'm not attractive. I'm confident people don't like me. I'm confident I'm not good at this. I'm confident I'm not good at sales. I'm confident I'm not confident. It's just nonsense. You're so sure of it. You're like, Marcel, but listen, I'm not confident. I can't go on stage. I can't do that. All right. How sure are you that? I'm pretty sure. Well, suddenly you go into hypnosis where nothing's certain. There's no reality. And I tell you, you're me. And all of a sudden you speak on stage and you're a public speaker and you're charismatic. Beliefs change quickly, depending on intention, like I said. But here's what's going to hold you back. I'm glad you're liking this video. Make sure you click the link below right now and secure your seat to my next seminar. You'll see a link in the description. Get yourself a ticket right now because they always sell out. I will see you in person. If you like this content and you want to change your life in person with me at my next event, click that link right now. Get yourself a ticket. Get one for your friends, your family, whoever you want to bring, and I will see you there. So now I will explain to you a hierarchy. I came up with this at 16 years old. And the reason I came up with this was because I just kind of wanted to figure out how girls think and how guys think and why things work versus why they don't. It's a very, very simple hierarchy. I understood we have hierarchies. I didn't know what Maslow's hierarchy of needs was. I didn't understand any of that. Now, obviously, I'm a lot more educated than I was at 16, as that was nine years ago. But here's what I'll show you. At the top of the hierarchy, and by the way, this is male and female. They are different. Male confidence is not displayed like female confidence. So let's briefly talk about it. What are two number one driving instincts? One is, survival. second is, for survival and reproduction. Survival and reproduction drive every behavior, period. So, we got survival, and my handwriting is wonderful. If you can't read it, it's fine. Survival, reproduction. When you look at most women, are most women socially not confident? They can't really socialize, they're not charismatic, they're kind of out of touch with reality? Do you ever see a woman be like, I can't go up to that person? How many girls here would have a hard time walking up to a random stranger? How many guys have a hard time walking up to a random stranger? How many? Fucking liars? No one's even raising their hand. They're like, that's me, but I'm not going to raise my hand because, you know, he'll call on me. Right? So the reason is, is because men are significantly more confident in giving what? Their emotions. They're more confident in giving their emotions, especially if they have lower value. So to compensate for their lack of value, they will make up for it with emotions. Right? We have, what's, what's a male's value? Providing. Providing. Providing, Providing what? Resources and the secure, and how, how do you have security with resources? Emotions. So a male with no value will give anyone 
or just easily give away his emotional security, his emotional attachment. In other words, he'll give away his resources with ease. Does that give him any value? No. Now you look at like a celebrity, maybe you look like Justin Bieber or something. How easy is Justin Bieber to lock down? Huh? Is it easy to get? Can any of you just walk up to Justin Bieber ladies and be like, you're my new husband? No. It's a lot harder, right? So his value is a little bit higher. Now, what does a woman offer? And this is biological. This is not even, like, we could talk cultural all you want. Now I'm talking to you from a perspective of psychology, evolutionary psychology. This is evolutionary psychology. Our behavior is this way. Any other thing, like modern feminism or all that, it came to the wrong place. I'm not that guy. I'm just going to say it how it is. All right? What is a woman's value biologically? What, what does she control? We control emotions and resources. We control resources. What do they control? Reproduction. reproduction. Who they decide to reproduce with. Now, that, think about it. They're not just going to reproduce with anyone. I'm talking about initially, right? Depending on where you are in your life. Maybe you're older now. If you're younger, initially you're going to be very selective on who you choose to reproduce with. Because... That's pretty much a life sentence. You're going to reproduce with the wrong person. You pick the wrong partner. You're fucked. You really are fucked. And your DNA isn't, your DNA is not thinking like, ha, plan B abortion. That's not what your DNA is thinking. Our DNA doesn't even know that exists. Your DNA is like, yo, I live in a cave. If the wrong guy gets me pregnant and he dies because he's weak or he leaves me or he doesn't take care of me, no other male is going to want to be around me. At least no valuable male who can go get a bunch of resources. The only male that's going to want me is a male who has no value. And I'm going to sit here and I'm be screwed because I'm going to have to raise these kids and I'm not going to have anyone to help me out. I can't go hunt when I'm pregnant. And us as babies, I don't know if you've, you know, but an infant, unlike other animals in the animal kingdom, is useless. It's like, yeah, for like two years. It's just like a fucking thing that shits and farts and burps and, and it's, you know, and you're like, but I love it. It's the cutest thing in the world. I don't know about you, but if you look at a baby when it's born, it ain't cute. It's ugly. <laughs> You're like, but look how beautiful. It's not beautiful yet. It's ugly right now. You know, it's <laughs> and it's useless. You look at a deer, an elephant, or any other animal. These things look like that looks like an elephant. That looks like a deer or a camel or whatever. You look at a human being. It looks like a fucking alien. Like, yeah. like and it's like fucking. Ugh. <laughs> Tell I ain't ready for that. So. So what? It, well, yeah, that's right. It depends on who the dad is, right? Yeah. All right. So at the bottom, at the bottom, how do we determine the value? And by the way, everyone says it. Just everyone's scared to say it. So we'll just, we'll be honest here. What is the one thing you could talk shit about and the number one insult, not even men. I'm not even going to have a man say it. So I have a woman say it. What's the number one insult a, man, a woman can give another woman? It's you're what? You're a, you're a slut. You're a whore. She sleeps with everybody. Why? Because what's the equivalent to a female slut in, in male form? What is that? The guy who's fucking liking everyone, the friend zone guy. He's also a slut. No respect, no value. But everyone's going to want to be around him. I want your resources. I don't have to do anything for them. And I want to sleep with you, but I don't want to commit. I'm not going to give you any resources. So that's at the bottom. Now, that's important because there's only one situation where you'll have that desperation. Now, Empress Josephine, if you look at the, Josephine's my twin sister's name, but Napoleon married a woman named Josephine. She became the empress. And if you look at her situation, she was, you know, at the time when there was a different, uh, there was different royalty in charge. Nobody liked them. So they had all of these peasants, she was a peasant at the time, in prison. And the only way you could survive in prison is if you got pregnant. So, she had to do what she had to do. She was at the bottom of the hierarchy in Maslow's period of needs. And to survive, she did what? She got pregnant. And she explained that to him. And he didn't care. He still loved her. And he ended up being with her. Now, the reason I bring that up is because you can, you, can you go up on this hierarchy? Yes. yes. Can you go up on this hierarchy? Yes. But I'm trying to show you what the difference in behavior looks like. Now, let's compare royalty. Right? Let's say, and I'm, I'm talking about this because it's a very easy analogy. If you look at like a king, can a king be with anyone he wants? Can a queen be, be with anyone she wants? Is it, yes, she, she can. She can. Now, a queen 
Is she just with every person? She just, oh yeah, I was with that queen, I was with that queen. No, she's only with a king, right? A king, on the other hand, sometimes he could be promiscuous or whatever, but he's only going to have one queen. He's only going to be with one queen. Like, she's the only queen. She's the only one. They did a study at Harvard and in Stanford, and the study says that 80% of the time, if you were to go on a date, right, let's say you were going out with someone, if you were a man and you had a partner and she would go out to dinner with someone else, you would be way less jealous than if she went and slept with someone else. Now, if you invert that and you're a woman and your man sleeps with someone, it was meaningless, or he goes to dinner with someone and has a really strong connection with him, that would upset you more. So biologically, there's a reason. If you're a man and I'm investing all my resources into someone and all of a sudden they have someone else's offspring, or they could have someone else's offspring. There's no paternity test. I can't go check if I met my number one instinct other than survival. So genetically, my brain says, that's a lost cause. You have to go invest somewhere else. So the only thing that gave a man security would be the loyalty that he would know that he has security, that this is his offspring. Inversely, a woman wants to know that he's not going to fall in love with someone else because if he does, then she'll just leave, he'll just leave her. There's no other investment. Like really, the only reason to fall in love is that he doesn't just get up and leave. The reason it's so hard to leave someone once you've had a kid with them in the US is because even the people who made the laws understand our nature. Our nature is, well, if there's no reason to stay, then I could just get up and leave, you know? I don't need to be a responsible human being. And that's what people would do. It's like, well, there's no, but that's horrible for them. So you have to realize it's in our DNA to understand that. Now, when you look at this hierarchy, there are two metrics I'd like you to look at, both for men and women. And this is important. This will change your perception entirely. There is your perceived value, how you look like on the outside. And there is your real value, how you see yourself. Real value is how I see myself. Perceived value is how others see you. The reason I show you dynamics is because they are different. If you look at social dynamics, they are different between men and women. Now, if you have, let's say, a failing marriage, the reason you have a failing marriage is because the hierarchy is fucked up. There is a social hierarchy all the time. In school, there's a social hierarchy. When you go to school, who's, in, who's supposed to be in charge of the classroom? Teacher. But if the kids are in charge of the classroom, is the classroom orderly? Absolutely not, because they don't respect the hierarchy. If you go home and the kids are telling the parents what to do, is there order? Absolutely not, because there's no hierarchy. In everything, there's a hierarchy, no matter what. And when the hierarchy collapses, so does law and order, because there's no respect. It has to be that way. It's in our DNA. And we're always testing to see where someone's at. I'll talk about this afterwards, because we're talking about framing. Why do I care about framing? Because this is something we do. We're trying to see where people are. We're always measuring their value, their worth. We're judging people's status. So let's say you're a male, and you're an average male, OK? Well, if you found an average female, you're going to fall in love. It makes sense. If you find a female that's not on your level, and you're an average male, and I'm talking about real value now, right? So this is while you see yourself, this is how you see them. If you're a female and this is where you're at and this is how you perceive them, it's all about perceived value, right? So if you're male and you're talking to females, it's how I perceive them versus how I perceive myself. If I'm the female and that's a male, it's how I perceive myself versus how I perceive them. Remember, you can perceive someone else's value. You'll never really know their value at the beginning. And once you know their value, it'll either remain Hierarchy will change or it'll stay the same. So, and I'll explain this. You don't have to understand it yet. You'll understand it shortly. So let's say I'm an average male and I'm talking to a below average female. Well, she might sleep with me and I'd have a good time, but I'm never going to commit. Now, if I'm a super high value male, I may not even respond. I may not even look at him. The inverse and extreme of that is like some guy in, you know, India or something messaging Beyonce on Instagram saying, I'm going to marry you. You know, like it doesn't make sense. So now you have a low value guy, you have a higher value woman. And by the way, the majority, majority of the time, this is the dynamic. Like 90 something percent of the time, that's the dynamic. Well, he'll chase, 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 chase. She'll be like, okay, you can take me to dinner, you can buy me flowers, get me chocolates. I'm not gonna do anything with you. I won't even kiss you. I may not even take you serious. I might even flake you. I might even see someone else at the same time. Same if the guy's up here, he's also not committing. He is also seeing other people at the same time. Now you find someone who's of equal value, 
you can have love. So the only way to have love is if this is in the middle. What is this? Well, on the left side, if it's male, it's what? And male is also masculine, because you could have homosexual relationships, masculine and feminine. That's the dynamic. There's a masculine and a feminine in every dynamic. On this side, a male takes 100%, right? So if a male's all the way here, we're extreme, that means he's here and she's here. If you're on this side, it means that she's here and he's here. And what this is telling you is what the dynamic looks like. So it's like a scale. If I'm all the way on this side, what's happening is he's literally just sleeping with her, using her, he does not care about her, he will never commit to her, he'll never do anything of value. The other way around, same thing. She's just wasting his time, never gonna do anything for him, it's just playing games. You have to see where the dynamic lies because where the dynamic lies tells you what's going on. And this is important because everything you do, the first thing you do when you see someone, are they a threat? The second thing you do when you see someone at any age is you perceive their value. What is their value? Is their value financial? Is their value intimacy? Are they gonna be a partner? Are they gonna, what, what is their value? You're gonna perceive their value. This happens in milliseconds. The second you look at someone, that is what you're judging. So, when you look at this, now we have a hierarchy. We now understand the dynamics between the hierarchy. Anytime a relationship is failing, it's because they're either going too far in this direction or too far in this direction. There's no balance. It's not equal, it's not equal. So when you say dating someone out of your league, what's really happening is your real value, the way you see yourself, is lower than their perceived value. Doesn't mean that they're actually more valuable than you. It just means you don't perceive yourself to be as valuable as that. In a business context, I wanna charge more money to more valuable people, but I don't see myself as that valuable. I cannot charge more money. They do not view the value. I'm showing you this in terms of a relationship. We could turn this into business. We could turn this into anything. It's the same exact principles. So, at the bottom of this, you're selfish. The lower you are in the hierarchy, the more you think about me. If my cup is empty, I have no food. I'm, a, I'm back in the day, I'm this caveman. <clears throat> I decide I need to go eat. So I stalk, you know, the shit of these buffaloes. <sighs> and I'm finding it, and I finally get to these buffaloes. Three of my friends have died, and I try to kill one, I fail, so I have to settle for these stupid blueberries. I get thorns in my fingers, I get a few blueberries, I come back to my little cave at night, three of my friends are dead, I'm alone, I'm freezing, one of my friends that knew how to start a fire, he's gone, I'm fucked, and someone comes by, hey bro, sorry I missed the hunt, how'd it go? Let me get a blueberry, what are you gonna do? you be like, get the fuck out, I'm not giving you a blueberry. But now you have so much food, you, you, you're like, this is gonna go to waste, what do I do? Hey, can I get a blueberry? Take it, right? Abundance, that's the top. So at the top, you're generous. At the bottom, you're selfish. You're generous emotionally, you're generous in everything. But you're not generous physically, you're generous with what? Resources, resources. Because you're confident in what? The fact that you can keep getting resources. If you're not confident you're gonna have all these resources, where do you automatically go in the hierarchy? Jack, pull it up. Awesome, so where do you automatically go, guys? The bottom. And if I don't believe I'm gonna make more money when I spend money, where do I automatically go? If you start getting stressed spending money, that's fucked. That means your real value, how you perceive yourself, is very low. If you spend money and you have a hard time with it, it's because you have low perceived value. You don't think you're good. That's a problem. The second thing, as you have a hierarchy, we are testing to see who's above us in the hierarchy, who we perceive to have more value. Now, in the past, I used to think, what is it? What is value here? You know, on the surface, superficially, what gives a female value superficially? Looks, maybe, right? How beautiful she is, how popular she is, how famous she is, how talented she is. If you look at a male, maybe how successful he is, how big he is, how strong he is, how tall he is, also how good looking he is. And I was like, well, if that's the case, then anyone who's good looking, anyone who's famous, anyone who's talented or rich, they should all have everything they want, right? But do they? Because that's not real value. That's perceived value. That's perception, that's how we perceive them. Johnny Depp was on trial with Amber Heard. They're asking him questions. And when you hear him talking, the guy talks about how depressed he is. 
Talks about how insecure he is. He can't even watch his own films. He's a brilliant actor. He can't even watch his own films. He can't bear to watch himself. So what is his real value? What's his perception of himself? Is it high or low? It's low. So I asked myself, well, what is the thing that determines value? It, it's, it comes down to one thing. And I figured this out when I was 16, which is why I have such a head start in personal development. Confidence. Confidence. Confidence is what? No, that's how it feels. Confidence feels like comfort. It equals comfort. But what is confidence? It's self-value. Self-value. Confidence is my own value. I set my own price. And if I know my price, guess what ends up happening? This is a law. This is, this is a fact. This is always what happens. If I perceive myself to be high value, even if I'm not there yet, eventually my perceived value will align and match. I may not be worth anything to others, but eventually I will be because I'm not leaving this reality. So it's just a matter of time before my reality matches my mindset. That's a law. You go to see Kobe Bryant play basketball at junior year in high school, unless you were in his high school, you didn't give a fuck about him. But now we think of Kobe Bryant, there's not a single person in the world who doesn't know who he is. I bring him up because he passed away four years ago recently. I think yesterday or two days ago. You know, so you look at real value. What is my real value or perceived value? Take a moment and ask yourself, what is my, and we're going to get in groups and we're going to do this briefly. Some of you may not like this. You actually won't like this. I'm telling you, I've had people leave super negative reviews of the seminar because of this exercise. But the truth is, if you can't face it, then what? I'm, I'm trying to give you guys the truth. The truth isn't to put you down. The truth is to get you to wake up and change. If you're not a tree, you can change. There are some of you that I've seen make a lot of progress. When I met you, I could see your real value is low. My, I would say, talent is the ability to actually view potential. Because I'm so delusional about my potential, I project that onto other people. I could actually see what potential is. I, could, I, I have a very keen sense to know what someone's limits are. And usually they're very, very high. Sometimes they're way beyond even what I think they know, even maybe what I know is possible. But what makes me such a good coach is the fact that I know what the limits look like. When other people talk to you, if you come off low value, you automatically are putting yourself in a position where you might be actually shooting yourself in the foot. Age usually increases your value, right? We look at someone who's older, what do we automatically assume? wiser, experience, resources, success. They, ha they have more confidence. They carry themselves different. When you think of someone wise, you think of someone like insecure? No, you think of someone with confidence, with wisdom. So why is it when you look at someone young, for instance, and they carry themselves a certain way, why is it, or you see someone who's young and they're successful, why is that so impressive? It's impressive because it's usually rare. Why is something rare attractive? Is confidence rare? Real confidence, true confidence is rare. It's attractive because anything that's rare has value. The more rare something is, the more value it has. So if you could tap into what I think is the rarest trait in the world, true confidence, which my goal today is to make you guys tap into that, you will have the most incredible life. True confidence means you're very comfortable being uncomfortable. The only way to do that is to desensitize you from other people's opinions. So much so that your opinion is the only opinion that matters. How often do you see someone say something about you and it hurts you or it affects you or makes you think, is this true? If you're truly confident, not narcissistic, confident, you can hear their opinion, you can think about it without it hurting you. It doesn't need to hurt you, you can reflect. Like when someone tells me, you know, this was a really shitty exercise, I can ask myself, well, was it? Hmm. Who benefited? Most people benefited. Some people did not. They didn't like the exercise because it triggered them. The beautiful thing about getting triggered is it's like a magnifying glass saying, look, here it is, here's the problem, X marks the spot. You're gonna change it? Or you're just gonna let it sit there and continue pissing you off? If you just stuff it back down, guess what happens? It comes right back up. Anything that gets suppressed, gets expressed. So I want you to write down what you think your real value is. 
And I want you to write down what you think your perceived value is. Then we're going to ask our group, what's my perceived value to you? Your job is to be honest. If someone looks like a one to you, say it. But tell them why. Don't just be like, you're fucking one. You look like a one because you're hygiene shit. You don't, you're not aware. You know, you, uh, you don't dress well. You don't take care of your health. You're clearly insecure. You're phony. You're fake. You're full of shit. You've had a mask on the whole day. You're not social. You know, one to ten. Simple. Now, why I want you to do this? Let me clarify. I want you to be aware of how others perceive you. If you're out of touch with reality, you can't do anything about it. If I sit there, people literally spend millions of dollars. Companies spend ten, hundreds of millions of dollars in marketing to get an actual grasp and data of what their clients are looking for. They don't just go, you know, we're gonna do a multi-billion dollar launch and hope people buy it and hope we get sales. They go do tons of research. There are companies who all they do is sell data to companies like this. And they say, this is what people want. This is what they're looking for. Here's what's trending. Here's what they find valuable. People found a fucking stupid ass fidget spinner so valuable it sold hundreds of millions of dollars. This stupid little fucking fidget spinner. But people found it valuable. So everything is either about creating the value, the perceived value through a marketing campaign and influencing people, right, through culture, or just seeing what is currently valuable. You, on the other hand, you're not really changing other than going to the gym and changing your mentality. So for you to change others' perception of you, you have to change your behavior. You have to change the way you see yourself. If I see myself as someone who's incredible, everybody loves me, everybody wants to work with me, everybody wants to hang out with me, how am I gonna show up? I'm gonna show up like the best version of me. But if I see myself as someone insecure, I'm gonna take a step back. I'm gonna be in the corner. I mean, who here believes that I actually have stage fright and every time before I get on stage, I'm actually trembling? For those of you who raise your hand, you'd be right to be wrong. Absolutely not, I don't have fucking stage fright. You know, like what, are you crazy? You're more nervous coming in here than me. Yeah, but here's, here's the point. If you can figure out what people think of you, just people who don't know you. Like there's a chance that you know you're more valuable than what they say. But why are you not expressing that version of you? Why are you suppressing it? Usually when you have a mask on, a, a great, here's a great example. Who's been hurt in a relationship before? So you get hurt and then you go into the next one. You maybe don't want to be as vulnerable. Maybe you don't want to show yourself the same way. And now you're actually hiding your value. You're not showing people who you really are. And look, the truth is eventually you get to a point where you're so valuable, maybe you intimidate people. And because of that, it pushes people away. But the people it pushes away are people that shouldn't be around you anyways. And maybe it also repels the people that want to take advantage of you and didn't have good intentions. But when you are yourself, people like you for you. They don't like you for the bullshit you show. And you save a lot of time. But when you have this mask on, you're only gonna bring people around you that don't like you and you can never express yourself. And the reason you're not feeling confident is because you know everyone around you doesn't even like you for you. You gotta be real. You gotta be yourself. So this should be a wake up call to be you. The first time I became confident, I'm 15 and a half, I go to the mall. I asked my friend to come with me because I thought it was normal to go up to a girl and get her number. My biggest fear was the fear of rejection. It could have been a girl, it could have been a guy, it could have been anyone. Didn't matter. Eight hours, I'm making excuses every second. Oh, she's with her mom, her dad, she's walking out the store, she wasn't pretty, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. Store's about, the mall's about to close. So my brain's like, either it's now or never. And I go up to this girl, she's with two friends on the side, and I'm like, hey, I think you're really pretty. I didn't think she was really pretty. And I'm like, you know, can I get your number? And I didn't say it like that. I said it way more insecure. She turns around, she doesn't say no. She just laughs at me, her friends laugh at me, and they walk away. In that instance, I became confident. I was like, wow, this is what I was so scared of. Two seconds later, I see someone in line, the coffee bean. She's 24, I'm 15 and a half. I walk up to her, I'm like, hey, what's your name? She goes, whatever her name is, and to date, this is my favorite pickup line. Works best if you ever want to use it, male, man or woman, doesn't matter. What's your name? Cool, what's your number? She goes, I have a boyfriend. 
I'm like, cool, so what is it? She started laughing, she gave me her number. I got so addicted to that feeling. I went back to the mall every day for the next three months and I walked up to everyone I saw. When I started learning hypnosis, I was so excited because I had a new fear. I got to hypnotize people and it hasn't worked for the first thousand tries. Eventually I got so frustrated, I'm like, it's go someone's going in right now. And guess what I learned to do differently the first time it worked? I pre-framed it properly. I'm like, this is what's going to happen in a second. Whereas before I'd be like, sleep. Of course it's not gonna work like that, it can. <laughs> it can if you do a pattern interrupt, but I didn't know what the fuck a pattern interrupt was. So my confidence was always growing and any time I have a chance to push the comfort zone, I am addicted to it. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to my channel and click the link below to get yourself a ticket to Mindset Master. I'm having a seminar on July 25th to 28th in Miami and all you gotta do is click that link in the description to get your ticket. If you happen to be watching this on a later date beyond 2024, well, there'll be an updated link in the description where you can attend a future event.